Okay, hi, now welcome to this, which is the first uh, video that I'm going to be doing on the Unit 3 of AQA Science. This is, of course, for those of you taking Triple Science at GCSE on the AQA exam board or taking the AQA IGCSE, but this does also overlap with some other exam boards. Now, the first topic we're going to speak about is the periodic table. Now, this is one of the most important things in the whole of chemistry because we cannot understand any reactions if we do not know what it is that is reacting. And the way that we look up those things and their basic properties is via the periodic table. So what we first need to know is that before the 1800s, so before the 1800s, there was no periodic table. Okay, so there was no periodic table. We knew that there were different elements, but there was no grouping system of them. We couldn't actually look up um, new elements as they were discovered because there was no way of them being collected together. And this meant that progress was very slow. And so in 1808, okay, 1808, John Dalton, who was a scientist at the time, published a book in which he actually grouped all the known elements by their mass. So different masses of different elements had been calculated by various experiments and he published groups of elements by their mass. Now this was great but the problem with that is that there was no order to them. There were loads of different elements all sort of lined up in a table and they all had different properties. And so building on this in 1864 there was another scientist named John and his name was John Newlands. Okay, now John Newlands published a periodic table that looks something like this. So let's just zoom in here. Okay, and so this periodic table, as you can see, has the eight groups that we see in the modern day periodic table. What he noticed was that the properties of different elements sort of almost repeated themselves in groups of eight. So as you order um, elements based on their mass, Every eight elements, you get something with the same properties. For example, if we take a look at lithium, which is labelled here, if we go along eight, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then eight, you get to sodium. And sodium has many of the same properties as lithium. It's a very reactive metal. It reacts with the same uh, compounds in a similar way. And so this seemed great, and he called this the rule of octaves. Okay, so he called this, or the rule, or the law, of octaves okay octave just means every eight and so that's all well and good but what happens when we go further down the periodic table well further down so around about after calcium okay after calcium this law really breaks down so it breaks down and every eight elements after calcium well we can't actually see a pattern there are different things that come into play and so the law of octaves really only works um, up until that point. And if you have seen the modern periodic table, you'll see why. Because if you have a look, after calcium we have zinc. And zinc is in the middle. It's in that block known as the transition metals, which is not in any of the groups. And that seems obvious to us now, but back then they had no idea what was going on. Okay, and so it was left to someone else to come up with a better model and a better periodic table in which to group them. And that chap was named Mendeleev. Okay, so let's have a look here. This is the modern periodic table as we know it. And you can see after calcium, well, it's not straight away zinc after calcium because that comes here, but everything in between has since been discovered. But you can see that after calcium, we get to this block, which actually is not in any of the groups. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or group zero, whatever you want to call that last one. But you can see that it breaks down. Now, the person who came up with this was Dmitry Mendeleev. Dmitry, let's hope we're spelling this right. Mendeleev. Oh, I don't think there's an I actually here. So it's just Dmitry without an I initially, Dmitry Mendeleev. And this was in 1869. Now the really clever thing that Dmitry Mendeleev came up with was that he placed elements in order of their atomic weight. So order of atomic weight or atomic mass. Okay, and that's very different to the mass because atomic mass, we're talking about the proton number. 
And this, of course, just goes up in one at a time. So we've got hydrogen with a proton number of one, okay, as you can see here. Then helium with a proton number of two, lithium with a proton number of three, and so on. That is better than ordering them like this, where you say hydrogen has a mass of 1.008, helium then has 4.003 here, lithium has 5.941 here, and so on. In this case, he's ordering them in the number of protons. And because he knew that each element varies in its number of protons, that meant if there was an element that hadn't been discovered, for example, let's say that, let's pretend nitrogen hadn't been discovered, but carbon and oxygen had. Carb carbon has a proton number or an atomic number of six. Oxygen has an atomic number of eight. So what he did was he left a gap until the next one was discovered. And so that meant that he made sure that we had an ascending order of atomic numbers, okay? And this meant that later on, once they were discovered, then of course nitrogen could just be slotted nicely into this gap. Okay, and using this model, he was able to predict the properties of the different elements, even the ones that hadn't been discovered, okay? And so he could predict properties of unknown Sorry about this handwriting. Elements. Okay, and it turned out that when these unknown elements were actually discovered, his predictions on the properties were a lot of the time correct. And so that is why Mendeleev is known as the father of the modern periodic table. Of course, since Mendeleev's time, we have included loads more elements which he did not predict, um, especially these ones down the bottom. Okay, but Mendeleev really did give rise to the modern periodic table as we know it today. Okay, and so next we're going to have a look in a bit more detail at the modern periodic table and have a look at the trends we see across certain periods and down groups. Okay, okay so let's have a look now at a fresh periodic table and we can start to discuss the organisation. Okay, so having a look at the modern periodic table, what we have is the elements organized into what are known as groups. Okay, so we have groups. Now those groups are the columns that we find the elements in. Now we are going to ignore this part of the periodic table, and these are known as the transition metals. Okay, transition metals. We ignore those because they aren't found in traditional groups. And then all we do is we label the groups in terms of numbers. So this here is group one. This here is group two. Ignore all the transition metals. Then we have group three, four, five, six, seven, and either eight or zero. Okay, you see this final group labeled as group eight or as group zero. Either one of those is correct. And so for now, I'm just going to call it group eight. Okay. Now, what's very important is that these groups actually tell you something about the chemical properties of the elements. Now, what the groups actually mean is that the outer electron shell of that particular element has the number of electrons in it as the group name. So, for example, if I take uh, hydrogen as the simplest example, okay, hydrogen has an electron configuration that looks something like this. Okay, hydrogen has one electron in its outer shell, hence why you see it up here in group one. Now, if I'm going to have a look at carbon, carbon looks like this. Okay, it's got two electron shells. Its inner one is full, but its outer one only has four electrons in it. Okay, and that is why carbon is found here in group four. Okay, and a lot of the time, by convention, we can just write the elements with their last electron shell. So if I take bromine, for example, okay, bromine is going to look something like this. I don't need to count anything. I just need to have a look and see that it's in group seven. So bromine is going to have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven electrons in its outer shell. Okay, now that's very handy because it means that all of these elements that are found in the same group are going to react in similar ways. If you've got the same number of electrons in your outer shell, it means that you either need to get rid of or you need to take the same amount of electrons to achieve a full outer shell. For example, group 7, 
If they obtain one more electron from elsewhere, they now have eight electrons in the outer shell, which makes them stable. So if I had a look at fluorine, that's exactly the same. Okay, it has seven electrons in its outer shell. Five, six, seven. And so if that obtains one more, then that is happy as well. So you can see that fluorine and bromine are going to, theoretically anyway, react in the same way. In real life, fluorine is actually a bit of an exception because it's the most reactive element in the periodic table. But for all intents and purposes, it needs to react in the same way as bromine. Okay, now that's how they're um, organized into columns, but how about the rows? Well, the rows are what we call periods. Okay, so periods. So the periods are going across the periodic table like this. Okay, and what that tells you is which outer shell you are filling up. For example, in the first period here, so number one, we only have hydrogen and helium. I'm going to do this part in a different color, actually. So we only have hydrogen and helium in this first period, okay? And that's because hydrogen and helium have all their electrons in the first shell, okay? So hydrogen obviously looks like that, and helium has one more than hydrogen, and so you can draw it like this. Okay, now if we then move to the second period, everything in the second period, so lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, and so on, they all have their outer shell in the second shell. Okay, so the second electron shell is their outer shell. So, something like lithium, okay, lithium, it has a full first shell, and then its second shell will have one electron, okay. Beryllium, it has a full inner shell but its second shell will have two electrons, okay? And so on, we get to oxygen. Oxygen, it has a full inner shell, but its outer shell will have six electrons, okay? So we could draw it like this. And so you can see that everything has been arranged in order of size. As you move across the periodic table, we add one electron each time, okay? So boron has one more than beryllium, Carbon has one more than boron, and so on and so on. So if you think about it, each group, okay, as you move down a group, let's say, for example, group seven, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine, and so on, okay, they're in the same group, and each time you go down, you've actually gone down by one period. And that means that they have one additional electron shell. So then bromine has an additional electron shell as well, and so does iodine, and so on and so on. Now the reason why this is important, and you only need to know this for the higher tier paper, okay, is that you can predict the reactivity. So you can predict reactivity of different elements. Okay, now what's important is that as you move down a group, so moving down a group, you have more electron shells. And that's something that we have already seen. Now, if you have more electron shells, it means electrons, I'm just going to shorten them to E minus, electrons are further from the nucleus. Okay, if you're not familiar with the electron configurations and the idea of a nucleus in an atom, have a look at my previous videos because unit three requires you to already know this information. Now this is gonna be a simple diagram showing this point. Let's say that this is your nucleus and your nucleus is, already, is always sorry, positively charged because it only contains protons and neutrons. Now if your electron, okay, is found here in the first shell then that is close to the nucleus and there's going to be a strong force of attraction between the two. Whereas let's say you have a nucleus like this, I'm just going to draw it slightly bigger to be correct, but your outer shell is let's say the third shell, okay, so out here. The point here is that to fill up the outer shell, you still have to have these inner shells full, okay. Okay, so what we've got here is we have 
a small distance there between the nucleus and the electrons, which means that they are strongly attracted. So strong attraction. Okay, this is getting a bit messy, sorry about that. But if you have a look here, our distance between the outer electron and the nucleus in this case is much larger. And we also have what is known as shielding from the inner electrons. So this electron shell is sort of getting in the way, it's acting as a barrier. This electron shell is doing exactly the same thing, it's acting as another barrier. So therefore we have weaker attraction. Okay, and these, these inner shells are doing something known as shielding. Shielding, okay. And so that was quite a long explanation, and why is that important? Well, if we have a look back at the periodic table, okay, for all the elements in group, let's say, 1 and 2, just to be simple to start off with, well, they actually only have one or two electron in the outer shell. And what they need to do is lose those electrons in order to react. And so if we have a look, okay, as you move down the group, these electrons are further away from the nucleus and have a weaker attraction. Okay, that means it's easier for them to leave. And when those electrons leave, that is a reaction. So as we move down the group, it's easier for electrons, okay, I'm just going to say E minus for short, or electrons to leave. Okay, and if you're looking at the metals, so group one and two, and even group three, that makes them more reactive. So as we go down this group, that makes them more reactive. Oh, you won't see that on the white there. More reactive. Okay, so as you move down the group, it's easier for those electrons to leave because they're not as attracted to the nucleus, making those more reactive. Okay, now how about on the other side of the table? So let's say we look at group seven. Now in group seven, they are, there are seven electrons in the outer shell and they want eight. So they actually need to attract an electron, okay? But as you move down the group, you can see that the electrons are less attracted to the nucleus. And so that means as you move down, to, down the group, the electrons are not going to be as attracted. And so it's harder to attract electrons, E minus, okay? And so that means as you move down group 7, as you move down group 7, okay, they are, so let's just make sure we can see that it's group 7. As you move down that group, they are less reactive. Less reactive. Because for them to react, they need to attract an electron. For the metals to react, they need to lose an electron. And if it's easier to lose an electron, it makes them more reactive. For group seven, they need to gain an electron, okay? And for them to gain an electron, as you move further down the group, this is more difficult, which makes them less reactive, okay? So what we see is an opposite trend on both sides of the periodic table. And that can be predicted just by grouping them like this. If we just had all the elements jumbled up together, then you wouldn't be able to predict those properties. Whereas because we have grouped them, okay, in a way that we can see quite easily, we have been able to predict this, uh, this, these trends. Okay, so easier for the metals to react and lose an electron, harder for the non-metals on the right-hand side to gain an electron. So therefore, the reactivity is greater for the metals and not so great for the non-metals or especially the group sevens. Okay, so that was a lot of information. I'm going to stop there. Um, I hope that helped as an overview. But in the next videos, we're going to have a look in a little bit more detail, okay, at specific groups of the periodic table. Now, as usual, if you do have any questions, please do feel free to put a comment in the comment box below or send me a direct email using the link in the description. But I look forward to seeing you in the next video.